The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And if you've come here today and you want your spirit lifted, then listen to the words and the music that we're going to sing to the Lord, and your spirit will be lifted. Join us in singing at your name. Sweetest frame, but holy trust. 
trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. I rest on His unchanging grace In every high and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil My anchor holds within the veil Christ come forward and we are going to read some scripture before offering so prepare for offering Deuteronomy 15 verse 11 says there will always be poor people in the land therefore I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land let's pray dear God there are poor people in the land. So many people need support and need help, God. And we, <laughs> we are blessed beyond what we realize. We have the means to be able to help people, God. And we do it cheerfully with our hearts, Lord, because we want our lives to glorify you, God. So we b just pray, Lord, that you would bless this offering and use it for your good, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. 
This past week, uh, something happened at the church where I broke the rules that the church has. Let me tell you how I broke the rules. Wednesday night, there was a couple sitting over here on a bench, and I guess I hadn't known it, but they'd asked several people where the senior pastor was, and we don't have provision for anybody to stay here at the church. We just, we're just not set up for it. And we don't necessarily, we're not set up too well with meals, although on Wednesday nights we do uh, serve meals. And so after everything was over, they were very polite. They just sat there and I noticed them over there and I came over and I talked to them. And they said that uh, they just needed a place to stay for the night. And uh, uh, normally I'd say, well, we don't have a place to stay. I can take you down to the shelter or whatever. And they said, well, we checked with the shelters and everything and they're all full. So I, I couldn't say that. So I'm sitting there thinking, what are we going to do? I thought, well, I can't necessarily go 
go down and, and buy them a hotel room because when you buy a hotel room for someone else, now the hotels make you put your credit card down. And if they trash the room, then it goes back on my credit card. And uh, so I thought, well, I think I'll have them stay in the church. That way if they trash the church, <laughs> we can fix it up. But I, there was something about them that I just felt like they were on the up and up. It, they didn't seem like scammers. I've had a lot of contact with scammers, people coming by, basically wanting to get something for free and wanting to use it for drugs or whatever. And I just felt like this couple was legitimate. So uh, we put them up in, uh, in the youth room and uh, Patty and some of the uh, kitchen staff uh, fixed, brought them a couple meals. And then um, we came in the morning. In the morning, I came into the office and they were laughing and joking with Luke and some of our staff here at the church over in the kitchen. And uh, they treated the room right. They, they did a good job. And, and they were on their way to Washington where he had uh, prospects for employment, young couple. And uh, it made me realize, you know, there's a lot of people out there that they say they're poor, but they've really made themselves and they're, they're keeping themselves in that situation because of their lifestyle. And you can help them by giving them food or something. I think the Lord would do that. But there are also people out there that are just between. They're between jobs. They're in a situation where they need some help. And somehow, even those of us like me that have been scammed more than once, we've got to keep our hearts open to allowing the Lord to work in us and help people. And one of our main values in this church one of our, our main strategies and values is that we will embrace all, that we will be a church that, um, that brings the gospel to the poor and helps the poor. And we don't help them as someone way up here and them way down here. We help them by coming alongside them and saying, but for the grace of God, I would be in the same situation as you. And I think the Lord wants us to be that kind of a church, a generous church, a church that takes a risk, and, and a church that sometimes gets scammed. He wants us to be that way. Because you know, God doesn't, God wants us to be good stewards of our money and not just waste the money that he has entrusted in our hands. I really believe that. So we do try to support programs downtown that have ways of helping people and they screen people so that they're not in the system scamming everybody. But you know, God judges your motive. And if you give money to someone on the street and, and, you, and you pray about it, and you feel like the Lord wants you to do that. And they take that and they use that for cigarettes or, 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 or they're an alcoholic and use it for booze or drugs or something. The amazing thing is that God looks at your heart and God judges your heart. Uh, not that we should be stupid, you know. I mean, the money that he gives us, we need to be good stewards of it. But that's always a tension, isn't it? We want to be good stewards, but we also want to keep our hearts open. And uh, Pastor Luke is going to do a kid's message now and then also preach on this value that we share, which is the gospel to the poor. And so kids, you uh, come on up here. Uh, any of the kids, you want to come up and you want to get a better seat, you can come on up here and sit on the uh, on the floor up here and Pastor Luke's gonna, gonna share with you and then Pastor Luke will be bringing us a message. God bless you children. God bless you Luke as you bring the message to us. How's that? Is that better? Yeah. All right. Good morning. Hey, you made it up. That's good. I'm glad. Okay. I'm going to ask you to remember something today. I'm going to ask you to remember something maybe that happened this week at school. Okay? You ready? I want you to remember a time that somebody else had something you wanted. And you really wished they would share it. But they didn't. Can you think of a time like that? Maybe it was your brother or your sister or a friend at school. And you're like, ah, oh, I want that. It's my turn. They should share it. But they didn't share it. Can you remember that? 
Has that ever happened to you? Has it never happened to you? Wow, you've got good friends. It still happens to me. It's happened to me. It happened to you? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I've got brothers. I've got two younger brothers. And so, of course, we had to share toys all the time, you know. So there are times when, you know, my brother had the good ball, and I wanted it. So I'd try to trick him, right? I was not very nice. I'd try to trick him. I'd say, yeah, throw it over here. We'll play toss. He throws me the ball. I catch the ball, and I run away. <laughs> I was not very nice to my brother. Here's what I want to tell you this morning. Adults start teaching us how to share when we are really, really small. And sometimes sharing seems really annoying. Because guess what? I want the good ball. But sharing is more important than sometimes teachers tell us and adults tell us. God has asked us to show love for other people when we have something good and they don't, to share it with them. It's not just to make the teacher happy. It's not just to keep from getting in trouble with your brother or your sister. I know that one. I've done that. It's because God has asked us to show love to people. And sharing is one way we can do that. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you to remember one more thing that might have happened this week to you, and then I'll let you go, okay? You thinking? Think of a time that you had something good. It could have been a toy. It could have been food, if you're allowed to share food. Something that you had was good, and you could have shared it with somebody else. A robot. A robot? Cool. Or you can... Or you can get two toys and buy them at the store, and so that way you I get share. six toys. That's a great idea. Yeah. You get two toys at the store, so you can share one with your friend. Yeah. Yeah. We all have chances to share, and it's a good way to show love. So I want you to look for a good chance to share. Okay. Okay. All right. You can go back to sit with your families, or you can go to Children's Church. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Reese. If the kids want to go to uh, kids' church, uh, they can. They can follow the kids, and you can pick them up over in the elementary room when, you're, when they're done. Uh, my wife reminded me about that, that couple that came here of something. I also shared Jesus with them. Now they were, uh, one of them, uh, they were both, both of them were already believers and they asked for a Bible and I got a Bible for them and also a study where they can lead someone else to Jesus. But I also shared, the most valuable thing we have to share with people is the Lord Jesus and I talked to them about their relationship with the Lord and they had, uh, and then they asked for a Bible so I, I got a Bible for them too. And so uh, uh, we, I'm going to say a little prayer for them right now and let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I pray for Charles, and I also pray, uh, pray for Charlene, and I pray, Lord, that you'd help them as they make their way to Washington, they would find employment and help them to continue and solidify in their faith and continue to follow you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. And pray for Pastor Luke as he preaches to us in your name, amen. Amen. Good morning. Uh, as Pastor Brock mentioned, uh, the last few sermons in a row have been focused on a group of strategies that our Free Methodist Board of Bishops here in the United States has set out, with the help of many other Free Methodist leaders, both pastors and lay leaders, to say these are strategies in our church as a whole that we believe are part of being a healthy church, a church that spreads the word of God to others through love, and the church that will grow. So, this morning the strategy that we're looking at in closer detail is ministry with the poor the gospel, the good news for the poor. And there's a reason today that the sermon title is not named Ministering to the Poor. 
It's ministering with the poor. But we'll get to that a little bit later. Now, whenever we're looking at how we should live, how we should minister, how we ought to do anything, really, if we can, we look first to Jesus and the example that he set. But Jesus didn't have a lot of cash. He wasn't a wealthy guy. So, in the Gospels, we don't see a lot of stories of Jesus helping the poor through gifts of money. Probably because he could also be classified as poor. However, we know that even so, the life he lived with his disciples involved regularly giving to the poor. Now, we know this for certain because on the night that he was betrayed, when he was eating the last supper that he would eat with his disciples, Judas got up from the meal and left without explanation after talking with Jesus. What he was doing was he was going to betray Jesus and turn him in and get him killed for money. But the other disciples there, some of them assumed that Judas, being the treasurer for the group, was taking money on Jesus' instructions to give to the poor. It was just made sense to them. So we know it was a regular part of their life together, even though, as a group, they weren't a wealthy bunch. We also know from Jesus' teachings, the way that he corrected those who were wealthy, the way that he encouraged the crowds, he constantly taught that those who have something, food or clothes or shelter, should share it willingly with those who don't have it. <clears throat> At our church, we want to value people who are in need, who are disenfranchised. When our surrounding culture ignores or devalues those who are in need, we want to show them that God loves them dearly and cares about them and wants to provide for them and show his love for him and that the kingdom of God has good news for the poor. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Can I get an amen from anybody who has been in a position where you could be classified as poor or in need and the good news of God spoke to you and helped you? Amen. Yeah? Okay. Excellent. Praise the Lord. So some of us know what it's like to some extent, more or less. Some of us have been in a lot harder times than others. Some of us don't know what it means to be poor. And that's just the way that God has blessed us or that we've been set up in the world. And we need to be grateful for that. But the topic applies to all of us, no matter what your background, no matter what your experience. This morning we're going to see how ministering with the poor is not just something Jesus did on the side because he was a nice guy. Bringing good news to the poor is a defining character trait of the kingdom of God. And it is therefore an important part of Jesus' vision for the world. If you will please turn with me in your Bibles or in the Bibles in the pews around you to Luke chapter 3. We're going to read from Luke chapter 3. This first uh, verse that, section we're going to read doesn't have Jesus in it directly. It's about John the Baptist. But it'll play right into what we're talking about, the kingdom of God being defined by the good news for the poor. Luke chapter 3, we're going to start with verse 2. Because verse 1 is just a whole bunch of people's names to tell you what time period this happened in. Okay, Luke chapter 3, verse 2. During the high priesthood of Ananias and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low, the crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation." John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers! What a call to worship, huh? <laughs> Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father, for I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. 
Who? Who? Why were people going out to hear this kind of scolding? You know? <laughs> what should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Good news, huh? Produce fruit in meeting with repentance or you'll burn. No, the good news was the kingdom of God is coming. The Messiah is almost here. But when John rebuked Herod the Tetrarch because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things that he had done, Herod added to them all this. He locked John up in prison. So, what do we have here? We're not reading about Jesus directly, but we're reading about John the Baptist. John was a prophet that God has sent to prepare the way for Jesus. John led an enormous what we would now call grassroots revival in Israel. And it spread, and it kept going on. Later on in the New Testament, after Jesus has come and ministered and died and was raised from the dead, and the Jewish Christians get spread throughout the Roman world, they meet people in other regions who have accepted John's baptism. So his ministry was huge. It made a big impact on the world, preparing the way for Jesus changing people so that they weren't just following the God of the Jews because they were born Jews, but because they were devoted to waiting and seeing his kingdom come on earth. It was a powerful change. And what did John tell them to do to make this big difference? Repent and to share what they have, whether it be little or much, with those who don't have enough. To be content with their pay do not try and make your life more comfortable at someone else's expense. In other words, to be good to the poor. But more than that, I think, is the underlying change of thought to measure what is valuable in your life based on a different standard than the world around you measures it. Because, you know, if money is our culture's primary way of measuring value, then it actually makes really good sense to shove somebody else down to boost yourself up. It makes really good sense to manipulate every situation you're in so you can get a hold of more of the available dollars. If money is your only way of measuring value. That's what our world does. Apparently the same now as it did then. God's value system is dramatically opposed to the world's value system. John's ministry called people to change the way they measure value and to let that change of thinking also affect their actions. That was what John did to prepare the way for Jesus to come. The foothold for the kingdom of God to land on was good news for the poor. Let's turn a little bit ahead in Luke to chapter 4, verse 14. This time we are going to read about Jesus. Luke chapter 4, starting with verse 14. Okay, so, in the in-between time, in the rest of chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 4, Jesus has come... He's been led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness, and he's been tempted by the devil, but he didn't give in to temptation. And he comes back into 
civilized area, you might say, from his time in the wilderness. And in verse 14, it says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. So he must have been pretty good at it. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Like maybe we already read that once this morning? Jesus is quoting from the prophet Isaiah, and we read that verse from Isaiah for our call to worship this morning. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Here Jesus essentially claims in a public setting to be the Messiah that the Jewish people had been waiting for for centuries. He reads a section of the prophecies of Isaiah and then says, well, I'm here. So congratulations, you've seen that prophecy come true. And not only that, he didn't just claim to be the Messiah. By using that prophecy, I think, he was giving the people a taste of what to expect from him. Because there are other prophecies about a Messiah that sound much more militant that sound much more forceful, if you can imagine it. But he chose this one. And when he read it, he defined his kingdom and his ministry in terms of wholeness and healing and of good news for the poor. We're going to read one more section of Scripture together. If you'll please turn with me to Luke chapter 7, just a few more pages over, starting with verse 18. We're going to read a little bit more about John the Baptist. Luke chapter 7, verse 18. This is the same John the Baptist who paved the way for Jesus to come. And he preached about good news for the poor and repentance. And then he called out the local governor, the Tetrarch, on his sinful way of living. And so, of course, the local governor threw him in jail. Now John the Baptist, who is such a powerful spiritual prophet, goes through a moment of doubt. We're going to read about that. Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 18. John's disciples told him about all these things, meaning the things that Jesus was doing. Calling two of them, he sent them to the Lord to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? When the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, Are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. You notice a little bit that list of miracles kind of grows in potency. Healing of various kinds. Leprosy. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. Right? Most amazing miracle. And one up from that is the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Whoa! Not only are the dead raised, even better, 
the good news is proclaimed to the poor. I'll tell you, if I was writing a, persu a persuasive speech, I would have put that at the beginning. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I would have made sure to finish with, the dead are raised! Jesus finished with the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And what he's doing is he's answering John. John in his moment of doubt, who's probably in prison and wondering, was all the work that I put in, all the time that I was following God and saying what he asked me to say, did it make a difference? Maybe it was hard to see from a prison cell. And perhaps we can even read into this. He heard about all that, what Jesus was doing. He knew. His disciples had shared it with him. And still he wanted to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah or did I somehow get it wrong? So I'm going to read into this a little bit and assume that John, like most of the Jewish people, was hoping for a Messiah that would be political and militant. He wouldn't only raise up the people and bring them to repentance, he would kick out the Roman oppressor. He would set his people free, literally, and get the people out of prison, literally. And John's in prison now wondering, if you're going to start a revolution, could you do it now before I get my head cut off? John did get his head cut off because Jesus was not a militant savior. And he reminded John the prophecies, the same prophecies in Isaiah, in Isaiah that said I would come, that said you would come and prepare a way for me. They described my ministry and my kingdom. My kingdom is a kingdom of wholeness and healing and good news for the poor. And he wanted John to know, I haven't been idle, and your work wasn't wasted. That kingdom is growing. That kingdom was growing even then. And even though most of Jesus' disciples didn't really get it until after he died and was raised from the dead, even at that time, there was a cultural revolution starting that was described and defined by changed hearts, by people who were willing to give what they had for the sake of others, by people who had repented of their selfishness and their sin, were following Jesus with their actions. And that good news was for everyone, no matter if they were rich or poor, if they were whole or broken, if they were powerful or if they were disinherited by the culture around them. That's good news. That's the culture that we in the Christian church today are meant to inherit. Does it describe us? As individuals and families and a church congregation, does it describe us? It often does, but there are ways that we can do better. Now that's the good news to the poor, for the poor. What about ministering with the poor? I know that giving to those who are in need is not a new idea to anyone in here. Some of us are better at it than others, but we all know that God wants us to be generous to those who are in need. Ministering with the poor, however, means that we don't separate the world in our mind into givers and receivers haves and have-nots. If we minister with the poor, then when we reach out to those who are in need with the love of the Lord, we don't just do it by giving stuff. We do it the, way that, the same way that we would reach out to somebody who we feel is on the same plane, perhaps, that we are economically, which is to say we reach out with the intent of making a relationship where we can share God's love through relationship and remain connected. And where if that person doesn't know God, we can bring them to know God through our relationship with them. It's not just an exchange of stuff from a giver to a receiver. Reaching out and ministering with the poor is forming relationships just like it is with anybody else. <coughs> That's with, not to. It's like Brock said, we're not the people up here giving to the people down there. We're just all people. 
And if I have something that God has blessed me with, then he's blessed me with it in order to share so that it can be a blessing to others as well. We reach out just like we would to anyone else, hoping that that person will become, if they're not already, a servant of God. People with needs have the same potential to be ministers for Jesus in the world as people who are wealthy. We see that over and over in Jesus' story. He didn't go around and pick the richest people in town to become his disciples so that he would be well-funded. Jesus wants us to be able to measure value in our relationships with others rather than in dollars. If every person has value to us, we're not only going to be willing to give stuff to them. We're going to see the value inside of them and know that they have something valuable to share with others, even if it's not money. Just as everyone has worth, everyone can accept a calling from God to carry his love into the world. We not only need to be giving toward those who are in need, we need to start seeing them as individuals with something worth giving. That's ministering with the poor, where you see yourself not as the giver to a receiver, but you see everyone around you as a potential minister. That's not going to happen unless we let God change our value system. In Stockton, we have a free Methodist church that has met in an inner city park for the last couple years, at least, instead of in the sanctuary. They own a sanctuary. It's on the outskirts of town. They don't have church there. They have church in a park. As people from that neighborhood around that park were invited into their church family, and as they accepted God's forgiveness, that church built a culture there where everyone who accepts Jesus and is taught how to follow Jesus learns that they are called to serve, not just receive. Some people who have very little help provide food in their gatherings. These people who are buying their own food on food stamps. And you might say, well, isn't that wrong to accept food from someone who has so little? That doesn't make any sense. But if that person really has value, if you're really willing to see value in them, not just in their possible bank account, then they have an important part to play in God's kingdom. And the church's job is to disciple them, to find out how God wants them to serve and empower them to do it. After a few years doing church in the park, the Stockton Church is now meeting in people's homes. They aren't fancy homes. There are homes in that neighborhood. A lot of them are bare minimum homes. And some of us might say, this is totally crazy. You're telling me they own a sanctuary, but they're meeting in low-income homes. Yeah, they are. It's working pretty well for them. Because that sanctuary on the edge of town wasn't helping them reach the people in the inner city that they felt called to reach. Now they are not just a church to the poor, they're a church with the poor made up largely of people who have needs, but who also have something to contribute to the body of Christ. That's a different value system. Now, not every church is called to be a park church. I'm not telling you that even though we just built a lovely new building a year ago or so, that we should ditch our campus. Different parts of the body of Christ have a different call, and different vision. But the visions all come together to mean that the love of Christ is preached including the good news to the poor. So how can we start to be a part of this change that Jesus wants in our value system? I'm sure we're doing it already. Many of us, if not most of us. How can we do it better? Let's start with our possessions. Maybe give away a little bit more than you're used to. A little bit more than you're comfortable with with the intent of ministering to those who have less and of breaking the hold that your possessions have on you. It's a good way to let our hearts soften up. Let's start with our minds and our hearts. And when you see a homeless person or when you drive through a rough neighborhood, check that thought in your mind that says, here is a problem 
and ask the Lord to help you look at it through his eyes and see, here is a potential minister. Here is an asset in God's kingdom. Here is a neighborhood full of people who have something worth giving, not just needs that need to be filled. Because God sees value in people, not just dollars. This one is hard to put a definite challenge on this end to say, everybody do this. Because if we're changing our minds and our hearts, it requires listening to the Spirit of God. The church in Stockton found out what they had to do, and it was pretty extreme. God might be calling you to do something extreme as well. But whatever it is he calls you to do, it's going to start with a change of thinking, a change of values. If the praise team will come back up and lead us in our closing song, um, I invite you to use this time of prayer to draw near to God. And if you'll let God soften your heart, just to see, maybe, maybe, there's something he would have you change in the way that you spend or in the way that you give or in the way that you live or in the way that you think. Are you willing to do that with me? Are you willing to do that with me? Oh, good. I didn't put all of you to sleep. Please stand with me. Let's sing. As kind of an ending to all this, uh, that couple that we helped this past week, <clears throat> when we were in the kitchen... Uh, the lady, and I, I said her name was Charlene, but I, I can't remember. Do you remember what her name was? It was... Close to Charlene. It, it was Chantille or something like that, maybe. But anyway, she says, uh, they had a backpack with all their stuff in it. She says, you know, this purse is almost brand new, and I really don't need it to keep my stuff in because we're keeping it in the backpack. She said, could I donate this, my purse to the church, and can you use it? And I said, sure, we have a yard sale and we can use that in the yard sale or we can give it away to someone that needs it. And I think that demonstrates ministry with the poor is Jesus challenges every one of us, no matter what our income level is, to give all, to give everything. This faith we serve is not give 10%, not give part, is to give everything to God. And so it doesn't matter how much you have, we all have to give the same thing. We have to give everything. All of our resources are at his disposal. My car, my house, my knowledge, and the, and the greatest gift that I have, the pearl of great price, the treasure in the field, is Jesus Christ himself. That's the greatest gift that we have. And so may the Lord work in us and help us to do that. We're going to sing this song, and if you want to take this, have this altar as a, as a place where you meet God and pray, you're welcome to come forward and kneel at the altar as we pray, and then I'll lead us in a, a word of uh, prayer as we close. Great, wonderful old song of the faith. Ho, everyone that is thirsty. in spirit oh everyone that is weary and sad come to the fountain there's fullness in Jesus all that you're longing for come and be upon the dry ground open your
Heavenly Father, there is a time for each of us to seek you and to find you. I believe there's not a person on this planet that doesn't have an opportunity to see you somewhere, whether it be in nature or in their prayers or in a vision. Or some of us have the incredible privilege of actually hearing the story of Jesus. And so our thirsty souls cry out to you. And you give us that living water, which is you yourself, Jesus. Help us, Heavenly Father, to hold nothing back from your use and your service. Bless each person here. Give us an opportunity to open our mind and our heart to how you might use us in a special way. Because every person we meet who does not have you as their Lord and Savior is a needy person regardless of their income level. For Jesus died for all. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Lord, help us to hold nothing back. Use us for your kingdom and your glory. And bless each person here as we go out in this new week. Shine through our lives, we pray in your name. Amen. God bless you. Have a good day.